Muchas gracias, Silvia. Uh, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Thank you all very much for attending this panel on the uh, challenges and opportunities, both for companies and governments in the coming years. Thank you also to Mr. David Malpass, President of the World Bank, and Mauricio Claver Carone, President of the Inter-American Development Bank, for being with us today. I am positive that this will be an enlightening conversation for our audience today. Mr. Malpass, Mr. Claver Carone, it's an honor to have you uh, both here with us today. I have here a, a long list of questions for you both. Uh, please do not uh, uh, worry beforehand. Uh, so Mr. Malpass, let me start with you, sir. Uh, which role do you think has the uh, infrastructure sector played in regard of the uh, sustainable development in Latin America? And, and how does this role look like in the current, in the actual context of post-COVID recovery? Okay, thank, th thank you. And le let me begin first just by saying uh, uh, thank you to Moreno and also uh, it's very good to be uh, uh, joining uh, Mauricio Clava Caron, president of IDB, uh, or bid uh, today. And I want to also thank uh, President Duque and Vice President Ramirez for their involvement uh, in uh, in infrastructure. Um, with and and also the uh, Colombian Chamber of Commerce, uh, uh, Juan Martin. Uh, thanks for the work that you're doing. Um, the the general points I'll make is just how severe. The environment, the global environment, is for developing countries. Uh, th this is due to the pandemic, yes, and the supply chain disruptions, but also to the inflation uh, that has that has uh, risen sharply. It's driving up the costs and and also reducing the availability. You know, when prices go up, uh, people buy in advance. And so that's a huge challenge to the infrastructure system of countries uh, around the world. As we think about climate change, it adds to that uh, a challenge because uh, the, the world is working to improve uh, greenhouse gas emissions, reduce greenhouse gas emissions at a time when prices are rising. So the, the, uh, the point I think that, uh, that we all need to think about uh, is that the costs are immense of moving in this direction, simultaneously uh, uh, responding to the pandemic, improving the supply chains, diversifying the supply chains, and doing it in a way that's much uh, greener and uh, has lower carbon intensity. Uh, what I've done in my remarks at the COP26 and at the Rome Leaders Summit were basically focused on the idea we need to have a lot of projects, really impactful projects, and to find ways to fund those from around the from around the world. There needs to be private foundations. There needs to be uh, uh, corporate uh, donations that uh, make this possible. And the multilateral development banks can play a role in working with governments, identifying the projects, implementing the projects over a period of years or even decades. Uh, and so that's the challenge that we have uh, in improve simultaneously improving infrastructure in a way that's much greener, that's uh, lower carbon intensity. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Mr. Claver uh, Carone, uh, uh, in this framework and on top of what Mr. Malpass has said, how concerned are you about uh, low GDP growth and, and spreading uh, inequality, both in Colombia and generally in Latin America. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to join all of you. And obviously talking about infrastructure, which is a key priority. And obviously it's great to be with, with my friend, David Malpass and my former colleague and who I worked with and for at one point in my previous lives. And I can attest by the way, how much David uh, cares about Colombia, having worked with him in previous life. So it's not a surprise that we're here together doing this. Hey, look, GDP growth is obviously important. We've uh, sluggish GDP growth in the past has been a, a problem in the region uh, over the last decades, uh, frankly. I think the one good news we're seeing right now from the pandemic, I remember when, when I began 
on October 1st of 2020 as, as and took over as president of the IDB, I said that my biggest priority was to prevent a lost decade in the region. And in so doing, you know, here we are a year later and we're seeing kind of all of the kind of global forecasts whereby they're kind of downtrending in regards to, to most of the world, but they're uptrending in regards to Latin America and the Caribbean. Now, the problem is that the reason for that is global commodity prices, whether it's copper, whether it's nickel, lithium, oil, et cetera. And what my concern is in that regard is that whether we're going to go into a rehash of what we've seen in the past, a rehash of the boom that we saw, for example, with the last 10, 15 years, whereby you know, GDP growth uh, uh, literally you know, was, was good for short-term populist policies in the region instead of the investments in infrastructure that, you know, that are needed uh, in, that, in, that, in that regards. Look, here's the bottom line in regards to infrastructure. An unanticipated increase, let's say, of 1% of GDP and in public investment in infrastructure can generate, can generate you know, almost half a percentage point of GDP the same year and really up to a percent uh, after four years. So that's important. And the goal here, the difference that we need over the last 10, 15 years, where we saw kind of the, the short-term populist uh, trends of that is that we need to make sure, and I think this is where it's different because here's what the pandemic brought. The pandemic really kind of showed the world the infrastructure gaps and showed the region the infrastructure gaps that exist, whether it's health infrastructure, whether it's digital infrastructure, whether it's educational infrastructure across the board. And therefore, I think today societies in the region more than ever are not gonna give a pass to governments to basically use any boom that leads to GDP growth for these short-term policies. And that means that they need to invest in infrastructure. And again, Latin America and the Caribbean is a region of the world that has least invested, that has the biggest gap in infrastructure investment in the world. Because the bottom line here is that investing in infrastructure, and this is why we're here, and this is why this is such a repetitive uh, uh, process, and I'm gonna say it ad nauseum, both in assets and obviously, by the way, better regulations to improve services is gonna be key. It's gonna be key to really make the leap to higher levels of development. That's gonna be the difference today versus 10 years ago. In employment purposes, you know, the opportunities that we're gonna see, and particularly if we invest in, in infrastructure are great. You know, look, for about every billion dollars, invested in infrastructure in Latin America and the Caribbean, there'll be about 30,000 new jobs that can be created. So what for us is fundamental is to consider the opportunities, the massive opportunities. And by the way, and, I'm a, and, 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 and let's talk about the entire development scale, inclusion for women, equality across the board, and the opportunities that that'll lead to uh, in that regards and labor markets, et cetera. So it's really about huge opportunities particularly if the region learns the lessons of the past and invest in, in infrastructure. And I'm going to finalize this question by saying, I am here today over a year later and not asking the question, are we going to have a lot of another lost decade? In macro terms, we're not going to have a lost decade. We're seeing you know, good, good forecasts in Colombia, for example, uh, of almost 8%. We're seeing 12% Chile in Panama, again, over 10%. We're seeing that the GDP growth, by the way, we're, we're going to, it's going to take a little bit to get to pre-pandemic levels, but from a macro perspective, we're not going to have a lost decade. Here's my concern. Are we going to have a decade of lost opportunities? And as a result of the pandemic, there's no person in Latin America and the Caribbean, no person in the world that doesn't understand the importance of digitalization, the importance of being connected, how the winners and losers were essentially based on digital infrastructure, the 60 million kids that didn't go to school because they had no access uh, to the internet over the pandemic. Now we have an opportunity to turn the page here and it's gonna have huge impacts on investment and employment. So the question now is not whether there'll be another lost decade, but whether we will have a decade of lost opportunities. And that's where we need to focus. And that's why we're here today. Thank you, sir. Uh, in this context, Mr. Malpass, what would you think would be the main opportunities for the uh, infrastructure, infrastructure sector in particular? Uh, I, I can't hear you, sir. I, uh, I don't know. I'm ready. <laughs> oh, so, sorry, I, I was. Uh, did, did did you? I heard. Okay, good. Uh, Go that, ahead, um, Moreno. That that is exactly the right question. Uh, um, and, um, I'm I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Moreno. That's exactly the right question. Uh, how how do we um, make the best use of this? And I want to pick up where Mauricio. Uh, left off as far as uh, we, we want to grab opportunities. So I'm just going to mention 
some thoughts. Uh, one is choosing the right project. So that, that becomes important in a country's plan. And then setting the incentives right so that you're, you're not doing uh, projects that are, that are maybe uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the most popular to the government, but ones that will really have benefit for the people and figuring that out in advance and then getting a good transparent bidding process uh, for for making progress on those projects. That means maybe a national plan. It certainly means public-private partnerships uh, that work. There has to be the involvement of the government and the ministries, but also the private sector uh, uh, helping state the priorities and then fulfilling those with a good procurement process that's transparent. These, these are going to be critical in, in uh, in getting an efficient use of uh, and choice of infrastructure. And I think Latin America can do much better at that. You know, historically, there's been the problem of diverting, for example, to import substitution kinds of, uh, kinds of projects. Those uh, probably are not the best use of, uh, of the funding, the limited amount of new investment that can come. Now, uh, another point I'll make is the world is really eager to invest in Latin America if there can be a transparent process and the regulations that make, make it possible for it to be a sustainable project over the long run. The, the nature of projects needs to be changing toward um, greener and cleaner uh, from a carbon dioxide standpoint. But I think that can be very consistent with the development of country of, of a country and with the job creation uh, that's needed. So I'll just uh, emphasize, uh, as, as Mauricio did, the uh, we want to avoid a decade of lost opportunity. And in order to do that, I think a good choice of the uh, of the infrastructure direction for for countries heavily digitalization it can be done quickly it needs public private partnerships in order to do it but it offers huge uh, leapfrogging for for countries thanks thank you sir uh, uh, mr clever carone may i ask you to expand on this uh, uh, taking into account specific uh, uh, things like job creation and gender equality, because I, I know you're, you're, you and your organization are especially concerned with this. Yeah, I'm gonna do that, but let me just, David said something that's really important. And, we, and David said that, you know, the world wants to invest in Latin America and the Caribbean. And that's exactly right. The world is looking, I mean, this is, I can't underscore enough the moment in history that we are living in today. And one is from the digitalization sphere. I mean, there was not a renaissance without a bubonic plague. The renaissance was a direct consequence of the bubonic plague. Today, the opportunities, these opportunities that we have today are as a direct result of what we're seeing from the pandemic. The whole digitalization, you know, it takes five years to build a bridge or a road. It takes five weeks to connect a community, maybe five months tops. So today, part of the reason we're building this 21st century IDB is for one of not just infrastructure, but also digital infrastructure, because it's the best impact we can have right now moving forward. But here's another reason that this is historic. The historic alignment, realignment, I should say, of global value chains. The entire world is seeing what's happening right now with the glut in, in, the, in the bottlenecks uh, of, of supply chains. We're seeing it from a transportation perspective. By the way, we're all starting to feel it in our pockets. We're seeing inflation. We're seeing it all throughout the world. Because here's the fact, the world in that sense had overinvested, the United States, Europe, and others had overinvested in Asia and in China in particular. So suddenly the world became over-dependent on our supply chains in that regard. Today, we're seeing a unique opportunity for this realignment of supply chains. And who could be the greatest beneficiary in the world of this realignment? Latin America and the Caribbean. Let me give you a statistic just so that we can fall off our feet right here. We did, when I came in, I'm very proud that the Inter-American Development Bank and the government of Japan are the only two entities in the entire world that are financing nearshoring. That means if there's a company from the United States, from any country in Europe that has its manufacturing in China that wants to move it to Latin America and the Caribbean, we'll finance it. And why? Because at the end of the day, my job, and this is not an anti-China thing, to the contrary, this is a pro-Latin America and the Caribbean thing. Because if that moves, and by the way, we're working on our first PBL, our first policy-based loan on nearshoring, and guess who we're doing it with? Colombia. This is a unique opportunity there to really bring in this, this chain. And what does this mean for the region? Think of it this way, and we did this study. If you take literally 
10% of the products that China exports to the United States, that under the generalized system of preferences, Latin America and the Caribbean also exports to the United States. So we're not creating new industries, new lines or anything, just the same exports, just 10% move them over. That's $72 billion in additional exports per year from Latin America and the Caribbean to uh, the United States alone. Now think of that, that's game changing. That's absolutely game changing. So this is a unique opportunity, but here goes, here's, here, here goes to the point and what, and, what, and, what, and what David mentioned about the desire is there. I hear it all the time, but what's the biggest problem? You know what the biggest problem is? Infrastructure. Costs, the costs for the logistical cost in, in Latin America and the Caribbean are 60% higher than in Asia. And why? Because of the weak infrastructure, because of the lack of infrastructure. So just imagine where the region would be and what that would mean if we, can, if, we, if, we, if, if we were able to improve that infrastructure, the investment went into the infrastructure, particularly amongst this historic realignment. Talk about an opportunity indeed. Now look, when you do that then, we have job creation and an infrastructure. I told you some of the job creation numbers, what it would mean. Tens of thousands of jobs, but here's an important thing as well. Women in particular, and look, and, and, and not just in infrastructure, but when you, when you bring it all throughout, the greatest opportunity for economic growth in the region is allowing and helping and creating the conditions for women to enter the labor market. Let me give you probably the second statistic that's gonna knock you off your feet in regards to women. If women were able to enter the labor market in Latin America and the Caribbean at OECD levels, at OECD levels, at the OECD median. So again, I'm not even looking here at pie in the sky. You know the potential for GDP growth in the region? 20%. There's not a single thing that can take place in the region that would have a greater impact on GDP growth than the incorporation and the structural benefits and the ability for uh, uh, women to participate in the, in the labor force. And by the way, additionally for employers, increasing the participation of women has proven to have all sorts of impacts in that regard. So let, me give you, let me give you an example, uh, Chile. We worked there with the Ministry of Transportation to implement a program to really form and hire women as bus drivers. Talk about infrastructure, bus drivers. And the results were really clear. Employers have reported that, 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 that women drivers had less and less accidents, had better relations with users of the system. Uh, they've, they've known, they've, they really became a, 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 a conflict resolution, a, 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 a conflict less, a kind of actually a, a conflict deterrent uh, in, in that regards. So this, I mean, I, and, and by the way, so it's not just job creation, GDP growth, but really across the scale, there's no more game-changing impact, no more game-changing impact that can be had across the scale than the incorporation of women and the conditions for women to be able to enter the labor market across the board. So by the way, I'm also really thrilled. I mean, obviously Colombia has done a great deal in this matter. We're seeing important advancements. We had a, a, a publication of practical guides on how to include gender and also David mentioned climate change in the programs and projects across sectors, including obviously uh, infrastructure there. And one of the several engagements of, of, of the country in that matter was with Colombia. And I think that you know, we're, we, we're really hopeful and I think that there's great strides and efforts uh, that can be made there. So I think this is a unique opportunity uh, across the board. It's a win, win, win. And, 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 and that's why we're here. Sir, uh, what, what has, or which has been in your opinion, the main contribution of both banks, in this case, the organization you lead uh, uh, to address problems in the region during the uh, pandemic? What we are focused on is doing projects that actually work for countries. So during COVID, uh, beginning in April of 2020, we put uh, in motion a fast track approach uh, for, for doing COVID-based uh, projects because one of the things we recognized from the beginning was the need for every country to be responding using uh, using uh, 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 medical equipment, oxygen, uh, masks, and so on. And so we have now uh, 150 uh, programs in place. So that, that took a lot of work through the board to get a, uh, a framework so that uh, everyone could, or m most of the develop, uh, all of the developing countries could have a basic program. That was then expandable with vaccines. So we've been doing uh, vaccines into countries. I have to say, you know, one of the challenges on vaccines was the lack of uh, contracts by the 
by the countries themselves. So there still are not enough contracts for purchase of vaccines uh, by the countries. They have to take the initiative to actually get a delivery date. I, I, I chair a task force uh, with, uh, with WHO, IMF, and with WTO, uh, where we specifically are urging uh, the, uh, the advanced economies to swap their vaccine early deliveries with developing countries and the developing countries to take early deliveries uh, and to be prepared to uh, use those vaccines quickly uh, to get shots in arms. So that is, is an important project and the World Bank, uh, I think did a very good job uh, in, the, in the COVID response effort. Um, I could go through quite a few of our specific programs in Latin America, but I wanna turn gears a little bit and, and pick up uh, on, on, on general ways to really grab this opportunity that Mauricio is talking about. One is through uh, asset sales themselves. You know, in the balance sheets of Latin America, including the state-owned state enterprises, and I say Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, there are assets on the books of banks that are good yielding assets, but they take up space. So one of the things I think we should be looking for uh, is a way to pool those assets and make them saleable uh, and then replace them on, on the balance sheets of the financial institutions with new assets. So there, there needs to be an explicit uh, goal of turning over assets uh, by, by, from commercial banks into the securitized portion of financial markets. That's happening a bit. I've heard, I've heard, I've heard for example, in Peru, the accounts receivable are be becoming saleable. Uh, it's something that Mexico has done for a long time. And that's powerful because it frees up space on balance sheets. So I want to mention that. Uh, number two, I want to mention the importance of Latin America and the Caribbean speaking um, to the United States and getting full implementation of, of, uh, of trade and commerce in ways that are beneficial. You know, the U.S. is still uh, operating the Jones Act, which blocks the shipping of Latin America and the efficiency of the Caribbean uh, from, from the U.S. So that's one issue. There's the, there's the ethanol uh, uh, concentration in the U.S., which is distortive of the crop flow uh, within the Western Hemisphere. There's the difficulties of correspondent banking and the FATF uh, regulations. The World Bank has technical assistance to help uh, countries with that. And uh, on trade also, I encourage uh, rational uh, regional trade. You know, the Pacific Alliance, I think, has had some, some uh, specific areas that are useful in forming somewhat bigger markets that can interact with globalization more effectively. And final point then kind of to your question of M, uh, MDBs, we work uh, through country platforms. And so I really wanna encourage uh, countries around Latin America and the Caribbean to interact with the World Bank, with the Inter-American Development Bank uh, and with NGOs and with government ministries and pick people that are effective within each individual country and ask them to host meetings, to bring people together uh, in order to pick uh, uh, to, to really make sure that the highest priority projects are done. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, just to uh, uh, we're clear here, when I say Latin America, I, I mean Latin America and the Caribbean. I know that uh, your uh, the, the World Bank and the uh, uh, and the bid both use uh, uh, figures and statistics for the whole region, but for short, I, I say Latin America, but but I mean uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. Thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Claver Carone. Uh, would you expand on that on about which has been your uh, the main contribution of of your organization uh, to the region during the pandemic? Yeah. Look, obviously, as, as with all aspects of life over those past two years, the, the pandemic really posed an unprecedented challenge to all of us in the multilateral development banks as really we sought, particularly here at the IDB, to respond to the historic challenges in Latin America and the Caribbean, obviously, uh, um, uh, particularly. Now, for us to address both the public health and the socioeconomic impacts, we designed really operational tools to rapidly, as quickly as possible, mobilize resources to our member countries and to really process sovereign guarantee operations in priority areas. 
over 31 million people have lost full-time jobs and, and over 40 million have really fallen into poverty across the region due to the pandemic. Some 50 plus million have fallen out of the middle class. Uh, so we're seeing that socioeconomic impact. It's not about macro terms anymore. We need to measure this in social economic impact. So we made substantial changes to loans in, in our execution. We designed rapid approval and execution loan prototypes really to finance uh, priority projects in, in four areas. Immediate response to the public health emergencies, social safety nets for vulnerable populations, economic productivity and employment, and then for uh, uh, fiscal policies uh, to really mitigate uh, economic impacts. In the first year of the pandemic, uh, that allowed us to approve uh, nearly 40 projects for nearly $7 billion. I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, we approved operations in Ecuador, Brazil to protect uh, small, medium uh, and micro enterprises and, and, and employment that generates from that and to also finance the most vulnerable sectors of the economy uh, through second tier banks, which is also really important. So we prioritize sectors based on vulnerability where we saw trade, transportation, tourism, agriculture that was particularly impacted. We also expanded the use of what we call our contingent credit facilities for natural disaster emergencies. So I also include public health risk and, and really improve the management of the country's uh, contingent public liabilities in that regards. We authorized as well the reformulation of the active portfolio of projects to redirect uh, almost one and a half billion to attend the COVID emergency. Uh, we, Paraguay is a good example. We reallocated some funds uh, from a transportation loan, for example, and we constructed with that six contingency pavilions, which helped the country with the response to COVID-19 patients. We also allowed with, through that the construction of structures that employed over a thousand Paraguayans, facilitated incorporation of more than uh, almost a thousand new beds uh, into the health system. So we had to do be uh, creative as a result of that. Now, I think as a result of all these efforts that we saw to provide emergency resources uh, as well, we approved uh, almost $8 billion in financing reallocations, reformulations, so obviously focusing on immediate uh, response against safety net, economic productivity, fiscal policies. 60% uh, of all of this was destined for the smallest and most vulnerable countries in the region, which is particularly uh, uh, important. We're also very proud that we created uh, without any new money in coming in, but basically re reassigning a billion dollars uh, to help countries buy, distribute COVID-19 vaccines. And we also launched a guarantee initiative for the bilateral purchases of countries with the pharmaceutical companies uh, of the vaccines. In regards to technical assistance, we, we issued strategies to prevent contagion uh, in civil works uh, for the reopening of schools, which is key. Uh, we supported contingency plans for, for service utilities uh, and, and, and a bunch of other things. Let me pick up on a, on a couple of things though, uh, additionally that, that David said, and I think it's a great opportunity. And he mentioned the Pacific Alliance, which is key. Hey, look, you know, the inter-regional commerce is, is, is key. You know, unfortunately, you know, while in Asia, you have you know, over 40% of commerce is interregional. And in Europe, it's over 60%. In Latin America and the Caribbean, it's less than 15%. When we talk about you know, also the, the opportunities uh, for and, the, and really the gaps that prevent uh, the flow of, of commerce and the opportunities from nearshoring that we're seeing, you know, if you really just look at uh, um, uh, uh, freight to port uh, uh, costs, if we could just decrease those costs, you know, by 1%, it would expand imports by over 5%, you know, and so, in the Pacific Alliance, even more. And this is really, really important because this is the other thing that we did here at the bank. We, as we were walking, we were chewing gum. And in chewing gum, we created Vision 2025, finding the opportunities for economic growth. And we've been implementing those along the health emergencies that we've been putting forth. So everything we put out, we've also then presented our Vision 2025 in the five areas for economic growth, nearshore and digitalization, small, medium enterprises, gender, and climate. We can go into all those uh, separately, but obviously I know my time is limited, uh, but that's- no, 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 don't worry about that. We have time, we still have plenty of time. So would you put a blame on what you're saying on the gap you're, 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 you're uh, talking about uh, on infrastructure or the lack thereof? Uh, uh, so, uh, with the uh, meaning that that much more investing has to be uh, uh, carried out in the next future to to close that gap. Uh, oh yeah, look, here's the problem. Over the last ten years, over uh, I'm, I don't know was that question for me or for David. Well, uh, for well, both. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, let's see with you because I wanted also to. Uh, 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 turn uh, to Colombia and 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 speaking about how to close the gap, how to uh, foster uh, uh, competitiveness and enhance the social impact of the uh, infrastructure public policies. Uh, which are the the main uh, uh, 
problems here? How do we close the gap? How we, do we uh, uh, foster uh, uh, all, all, all these initiatives that have to be uh, undertaken? Go ahead, Mauricio. Hey, look, here's the bottom line. Over the last 10 years, Latin America and the Caribbean has invested less significantly less than 3% of its GDP uh, in infrastructure. Let me repeat that, less than 3% of its GDP in, in infrastructure. That's less than any emerging market in the world, right? So we have the largest gap of investment and the largest gap of financing. So this is over like about $100 billion per year in gaps. And by the way, when I say in those gaps, I'm talking about in a digital, I'm talking about health, I'm talking about education, I'm talking about transportation, I'm talking about energy across the board, water. You know what keeps me up at night? Water. And it sounds so simple and it sounds so, 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 so uh, uh, kind of easy. But let me give you three numbers here that will keep you up at night. Look, I have them right here and I brought them on purpose because I want everybody to know, understand this. Almost 160 million people in the region do not have access to water inside their home in the region. That's a big deal. That's important. You want to talk about infrastructure? 300 million people, almost half of the population of the region, does not have access to sanitation connected to a sewage system. You want to talk about an infrastructure problem? 330 million people, more than half the population in the region, doesn't have access to water 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's a problem. And you want to know the biggest problem at all? If that continues by 2040, over 44 percent of the region's population will live in areas with moderate to extreme water stress. You can't have infrastructure without water. That's clear. So we're talking about these gaps across the board. And meanwhile, this region is investing less than 3% of its GDP, the worst amongst emerging countries in that regard. Hey, but we're great at short-term populist you know, programs to invest for, you know, to put out money for, for the next election coming out and in current expenditures as opposed to investment expenditures. That's another issue. And going to what David was saying, you know, bank, fiscal policies, you know, you know there's, there's, a, there's a hesitancy in the region to for investment uh, 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 funding in that sense. You know, we, we always look at current expenditures versus in investment, and that's gonna be a key issue and that's a key problem that we need to change that mindset so that the pandemic maybe illuminated everyone. And by the way, and if, and, if, and if politicians in the region don't react, the socioeconomic pressures from the citizens, from the population, after the pandemic in particular, we're already seeing it build up before the pandemic, but after the pandemic in particular, they're not going to give politicians a pass. Short term doesn't work anymore. We need to invest in infrastructure. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Malpass, I'm, I'm, I would be delighted if you could uh, detail uh, some of the efforts you've, you've, uh, you've had with Colombia in these past years in regard to this uh, uh, issue we're, we're, we're discussing here. Okay, very good. And I'm, I'm oops, uh, let's see. If I yeah, got no, you, we can hear you. It's okay, pretty, pretty super. Pretty I, I I may not be the best uh, uh, spokesman for the World Bank Group on this. You know, uh, uh, many many of you know uh, 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 Jorge Felipe Jaramillo. Um, Car I mean Carlos Felipe um, Jaramillo, uh, and also our our uh, teams, uh, country teams are very important in how we do this. Um, what I wanted to mention in Colombia, the 4G toll road program, uh, it's been important in allowing, and uh, bank, banks been investing heavily in uh, infrastructure within Colombia. You know, for Latin America as, as a whole, uh, the infrastructure program, or I mean the, uh, the lending program uh, as a whole has been sizable. For example, in, world, in uh, uh, Colombia, we did two DPLs, uh, $1.25 billion in support of the, uh, of the uh, clean and innovative in infrastructure policies. So one of the things, or you know, the, the World Bank operates uh, both through the, the policy formation uh, uh, avenue and then through actual uh, uh, investment projects that extend over a period of years. We've been working in Colombia with the uh, refugees that come in from, uh, from Venezuela That's and, and support in that area has been important. And we've been using concessional funding uh, for that through something called the Global Concessional Financing Facility that makes it possible to have uh, lower interest rate or very low interest rate uh, uh, loans and even grants for for uh, um, for operations that involve refugee flows, uh, as an example. And you know, within within Latin America as a whole, 
Uh, some of the countries are IDA eligible countries. For example, Honduras uh, is IDA eligible and receiving sizable grants and zero interest rate loans through the IDA replenishment that's now making its way uh, uh, to, to completion. We hope to complete that in December of 2021, 20, uh, uh, meaning just in a month from now, uh, and with, with uh, strong support from around Latin America because it benefits the poorest countries as well as, uh, uh, as, well as their neighbors. That's an important part of, uh, of what's going on. I have statistics here on uh, uh, World Bank, uh, 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 World Bank uh, programs across Latin America, but I've uh, I've lost it at the moment. Oh, here, um, on you know on a regional basis, we were able to deploy 29 billion dollars from the beginning of the crisis. That was part of the big World Bank buildup that reached 157 billion dollars during the crisis. It was a growth rate of 60 percent for the bank, so it's the biggest and the fastest expansion of the bank's commitment. Uh, commitments that was made possible by what I described earlier, the health programs and the vaccination programs. That was one part of it, uh, but also um, across the board, there was a uh, acceleration of activity. Um, of with for for Latin America, it was a combination of uh, IBRD loans uh, and IDA loans, and also work by IFC and by MIGA um, that uh, that made possible the expansion. So we uh, one one area that I'll highlight, um, which is the social protection area. You know, as we look forward to how the world is going to cope with future crises, it's important to have a social safety net. We were able to expand that or to fund the expansion of that in Brazil, in particular, with one of the largest uh, expansions of social safety net during the during the crisis. And the reason that's or it. It has added benefit uh, because the social safety nets can be carried out through digital means. Digital cash transfers uh, are one a way to reach the most vulnerable within a society, including women uh, and uh, women with families. What better way than to have digital cash that she can have access to and doesn't get taken away uh, by other parts of the community? Uh, and so that's that's a powerful tool. And it has the added side effect of uh, improving connectivity uh, for people throughout. So if you can create um, a digital digitalization, you get multiple benefits. One is uh, for social safety nets. One is for digital uh, uh, financial transactions that are very inexpensive, which is critical. One is you get a record of cash flows, and that becomes a source of financing, uh, especially for new new businesses. They can show that they've been uh, getting getting receipts, and that you can take to the bank or to a financing agency uh, in order to get uh, uh, financing for new inventory, for example. And that's powerful. And farmers, of course, benefit hugely from a digital infrastructure. So I, 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 I really want to um, make the point that digital infrastructure is less expensive than some others and gives benefits across a society. So we're we're really encouraging uh, rapid uh, advancement in that area. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Clever Carone and Mr. Malpass, uh, I would like you both to expand on that. Uh, could we have details of both banks' particip participation in, in programs in the uh, infrastructure sector in Colombia, especially stressing the importance of, uh, of what I think it's, it's key here, which is the uh, uh, so-called the PPP, so-called public-private partnerships, which are a, 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 an ideal model to uh, to bring forward uh, funding and, and infrastructure. I think you you both uh, uh, take part on, on, on projects based on this model. And, and I think uh, uh, I would love, and, and the audience would love to have some more details on, on, on which projects you, you are participating. I, I might go uh, uh, first very quickly, and then, because uh, uh, Mauricio will have uh, 
good uh, good details on that. I do want to mention the mitigation and adaptation. We're looking at several engagements in Colombia. Uh, one is uh, the, the, the green, it's called the Green and Equitable Recovery, um, which would be a, a fast dispersing uh, balance of payment support with a focus on supporting reforms uh, around the energy transition. There's also consideration of a uh, what's called a CAT DDO uh, bond. That's catastrophic relief uh, with a deferred drawdown option. So uh, that 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 had those that instrument has been effective because it allows the country to plan ahead to say, look, we know that occasionally a catastrophe hits. We want to be able to get money right away, meaning in in a number of days if there's uh, an earthquake, for example, or a hurricane. And so it, it can, uh, uh, th that one is uh, in the planning stage. Uh, and then we also have a resilient cities project. So it, it helps cities prepare uh, for catastrophes or for inundation, for example, for flooding uh, that, uh, uh, that can help uh, with the rebuilding effort. That gives you some, and I mentioned earlier, the migration uh, uh, assistance that we're we're providing and the uh, the uh, two, the DPLs that were done in 2020. These are the fast dispersing loans. They had a priority, and you know, for countries around Latin America, it's important to put the regulatory structure into an improved uh, condition. And so, what we were trying to do in Colombia is the establishment of liquidity lines uh, to support the electricity and the water utility companies. You know, a lot of this. Uh, and and also the the public transport systems so that they had a foundation that would allow them to uh, respond to the crisis. A lot of this uh, support that is done by MDBs in in general is in the details of how you how you make the changes that are going to be good for jobs, good for development, good for youth employment, good for women, uh, and good in the context of cl of climate change as well. Thanks. Thank you, sir, uh, Mr. Flavio Carona. Yeah, thank you. So look, I would, here at the IDB, our work, particularly on the infrastructure sector in Colombia in particular, can really be divided, I would say, along two axes. One, obviously, the importance of the concessions model, right? Public-private partnerships, which you mentioned. And by the way, I just came back from Spain, uh, whereby we talked to all of the big uh, Spanish companies, particularly those in the infrastructure space, which are leaders uh, in the region, and PPPs was a must. I'll give you at the end, I'll give you another uh, issue that they brought up, which is a concern, but obviously our work with PPPs is one of our priorities. And by the way, we're here in the world right now amongst the greatest success uh, in the history of public-private partnerships, which was the production of the vaccine, and we need to make sure that in, in infrastructure, we're doing the same thing. So we have been working with our, our PPP unit uh, across the region really to really promote efficiency, uh, which is key in the implementation and management of, of these projects uh, uh, doing so. We think that the PPPs generally can help countries really promote better allocation of risk between governments and investors to really foster innovation, focusing on outputs, supporting what we call the, the whole life cost approach, right? Uh, an increased efficiency uh, per se. In Colombia, IDB has been key in infrastructure and we've lent more than 2.5 billion uh, in the past five years by supporting particular government on different fronts and really to increase private investment in the sector and supporting PPPs has been central to that. We've also played a key role in improving legal framework, which obviously there's no PPPs without a legal framework, supporting that institutional strengthening, the capacity building, that's key uh, in supporting uh, project preparation, that's key. From the PPP perspective, Colombia, I believe, has been well positioned in the region. The country has invested uh, over 3% of its GDP in infrastructure over the last decade in that regards, and private investment we've seen has increased significantly, really surpassing now public investment and representing, I think, somewhere around 60%. We do believe, though, Colombia still needs to continue to increase public investment infrastructure to 5 or 6% of GDP. That's key. And private participation is going to be the main source of those investments, and that's obvious. In addition to what direct loans we give, technical assistance from not only the public side of IDB, but also IDB Invest, our private sector arms, as a group, we recently launched what's called the Project Preparation Facility, which we did it in collaboration with the FDN, no? the Financiera de Desarrollo Nacional in Colombia. And what we're looking to do here is, is really to, like, set up a diagnostic tool, right? Stating, start, starting with the creation of a strong pipeline of well-prepared, socioeconomically viable, fiscally sustainable, bankable projects, right? Which are gonna be 
the key to the success uh, to attract in, in investments. In regards to our finance projects, our private sector arm, IDB Invest, we really had had really successful infrastructure projects in Colombia, and we're encouraging the use of capital markets to really finance these projects. We participated in the financing of three projects in the 4G concession program, uh, which together represents over uh, an investment, I think it's a two and a half billion dollars uh, in, in about 500 kilometers of highways. We've also contributed to financing airports, ports, uh, improving integration, competitiveness there in the country. And obviously we're very interested in financing uh, emblematic projects uh, in the country. Let me tell you about two uh, in particular, which I think are not only emblematic, but are transformative uh, PPP projects, the Magdalena River PPP. And that's the first uh, uh, project I want to mention uh, because of the, obviously the long sought uh, navigability of the Magdalena River, which we had in our annual meeting in Barranquilla, uh, we launched and we announced and, and, and as I said, uh, infamously or famously in Barranquilla, I'm married now to Barranquilla and to the Rio Magdalena and proud of it because I think this could uh, be a game changing historic project. We think that this one in particular can trigger really a whole new vision, right, for what's sustainable management uh, as well, incorporating that in the use of the river. Uh, however, we think that the government needs to ensure, and, and what's our concern, not our concern, but what's our priority, is that the benefits go to the rivering communities to make the production more competitive, to preserve fishing resources, generate greater accessibility, goods, services, you know, all of that, the ecosystem. I think that it also has to guarantee uh, the protection preservation of environmental quality of the river basin that's what a new approach that we're bringing to it uh, the institutional strengthening of related entities as well uh, really updating the master plan for the rivers that's going to be all important steps and we're going to do so another emblematic one that that we're proud of is the puerto antioquia and we recently signed a 200 million dollar financing deal for the construction the operation and maintenance of puerto antioquia which we believe is a key asset to strengthen Colombia's competitiveness and participation, particularly not only in the global, but regional value chains. And, and this will be the closest port terminal to the main production and consumption centers. And that's gonna be huge. It's gonna allow small, large farmers in, in Ugala, for example, to really expand their presence uh, in international markets. And that could be game changing from a development perspective. We're hoping that it's gonna generate social value uh, with commitments to really hire local labor uh, to promote integral development of local residents, help raise competitiveness uh, with, with high international standards and in social environmental matters and work for obviously in implementing a, a, a port sustainability vision, uh, which is what, what, we, what we call it. Like given also our, our, our extensive experience using PPPs and as in, in, with Colombia in particular, and which I think has been a leader in this regard, uh, in traditional sectors such as transport and energy, we also think Colombia could apply these schemes in social sectors, hospital, schools, prisons, justice facilities. We've seen that Brazil, Chile, Peru, Uruguay have established successful PPP programs as well. And, and I think that in, in those more varied areas and they can share uh, those successes and best practices with Colombia. I'll give you one example, Brazil diversified its PPP projects by sector, right? With more social actors and also by geography with subnational entities, which is what we're trying to do uh, in Colombia. There, we, we saw the federal government establish some mechanisms to support the project preparation activities at the subnational level. And that's gonna be a, a key uh, in, in that regards. But as I, and as, I, as I am hopeful though, I think that there's regionally, you know, and I said, you know, there's some good examples there, but I think regionally, I think there's, 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 there's a big concern across Latin America and the Caribbean. I'm not talking about Colombia in particular here, but then also a great opportunity. And the great concern and the great differentiator here in regards to, to Latin America and the Caribbean is the issue of corruption. And therefore we have to deal with this issue and it's very important because 10 to 25% of the value of these projects uh, of, of projects in the region uh, uh, can ha has, uh, is lost due to corruption in Latin America and the Caribbean. And that's a huge issue. And therefore also we have to work on the quality of companies and we need to make sure, and I talked about this a lot in Spain with the Spanish infrastructure companies now, and I talked about it here. And by the way, one of the things that I'm proudest of in having this private sector growth and, and as, as obviously the financing and the projects are gonna come from private sectors, we launched now in February of this year, the largest private sector coalition in the history of the IDB. We started with 40 of the biggest companies uh, in the world, mostly American, European, Japanese, and we're up to now 120 uh, uh, of, of those, the, the, the global leaders uh, in that regards. But the standards that these companies bring is gonna be really important. And that's why you know, the participation in particular of US companies uh, with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act of Spanish companies that really play by the rules is gonna be key as we know that there's some players out there that aren't playing by the rules, that are state subsidized, that are that bring in low integrity uh, and have really, I would say, uh, uh, created uh, a, an uncompetitive environment. And by the way, 
you hear that from European companies, you hear from US companies, it's, it's the second biggest issue that, that I heard. Obviously I talked about PPPs, but it's the biggest concern on infrastructure across the region is the concern, and I'll say it because I'm not shy, with Chinese enterprises, with state subsidies, with, with low integrity and lack of transparency, which is already taking an ecosystem an ecosystem that's losing 10 to 25% of the value of contracts due to corruption, and it's making it worse, it's not making it better. So we need to make sure uh, to help in those processes. Now, the good news is also, uh, is, is, guys, to give you the bad news, the good news is digitalization. And I think digitalization uh, in, in that regards is a key opportunity to bring more also transparency. We're doing that across the, across the region. One of our coolest tools that we launched is something called Mapa Inversiones, which we launched with Microsoft the company, talk about private partner, uh, public partnership in that regards. And therefore we're allowing through digitalization for investors to follow the full scale of projects uh, through, the, through, through this, through this, through this uh, digital uh, tool in that regards, which is also gonna bring in more transparency, et cetera. By the way, we've done that in the green market as well. We launched uh, something that was called the, the Green uh, Transparency Index, which is for our green bonds. So that investors, you know, that there's, there's $30 trillion in ESG investment that's waiting, a private capital that's waiting to go and invest in infrastructure, infrastructure projects that are climate uh, and, 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 and green friendly. But yet, you know, a lot of these have become marketing schemes. So investors want to know what their money is being invested in. So we created, we're the only uh, international financial institution to have created this green bond transparency index to allow those investors to follow this full scale project. And hopefully we can attract more money. And by the way, I said this a lot at COP26, there's 30 trillion today there's going to be up to $53 trillion in ESG private investment that's just looking to be allocated uh, somewhere. If we can capture 10% of that for the region, that's $5.3 trillion. That's the GDP of Japan, the third largest economy in the world. That could be game changing for the region. But guess what? The, 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 the countries, the regions that have the best transparency practices that are going to be are going to make the difference. But there's also something good that digitalization brings with construction costs. Once we get past uh, obviously those other issues, it also is that it brings more efficiency to construction costs. You know, digitalization can can improve construction costs by 10 uh, to 30 percent uh, as well. So there's bad news and good news all across the board. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, this is a historic opportunity. And, uh, and by the way, there's, there's more private interest, there's, there's, there's capital out there. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's really about who's gonna create the best ecosystem uh, to attract it. Thank you, so-, so and By the uh, way, and in that regards, and by the way, in that regards, I think Colombia is particularly well-placed. Very good. Uh, I was going to say, uh, so we, you, you, you would both agree that uh, the public-private partnership model is key for the future of, of Colombia in terms of infrastructure, A, and B, that uh, one must uh, strongly address concerns around it, isn't it, Mr. Mapaz? Uh, yes, certainly uh, it, it is the, it, it, it's going to be necessary. Can I make some comments on I that? I mean, so, sorry, sir, I, I mean, like, uh, uh, a regulatory framework, a strong uh, 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 civil uh, and law uh, uh, found up, I mean, this kind of, of, of uh, institutional uh, uh, environment. Uh, exactly right. I was going to go straight to that. The regulatory Sorry. framework <laughs> is uh, is important for that. And can I say, as we as people talk about PPP, uh, we should recognize it's kind of a spectrum. So you can have different PPP. You know, you could call it PPP if what the government is doing is contracting out janitorial services. That's a public-private partnership that's not very complicated. It requires a contract and a relationship between the government and some private sector company. Or you can go over to the other side where the, the private sector designs the project and, uh, uh, and, and enters into maybe a financing arrangement with the government. And so we should recognize when people are talking about PPP, um, it differs greatly on the and, and should be used appropriately by governments. It's not a bad magic bullet. It's just a, a practical way of governments and private sectors working together to get the desired result. And so that goes straight into the need for the regulatory policies 
to be somewhat predictable. You know, as, as businesses look at doing business in Latin America, one of their big concerns, and uh, it, Mauricio is exactly right about the uh, lack of transparency in contracts, but it's also the changeable nature of the regulatory po policies. You know, this goes to the structure of the constitutional framework being having regulations embedded in the constitutions and then changeable every time there's a new government. That Absolutely. makes it very hard for businesses to know what their long-term, you know, businesses, a, a lot of the infrastructure that's needed, you need to be making a 10 or a 20 year investment. And if the regulation changes every four years, that's not a conducive environment. So for the countries, uh, I think they should be looking to have stability of regulations you know, regulations are never perfect. They find a balance between taxation and cost and uh, the desired goals that they're coming up with. Um, but but picking a direction and then sticking with it with the idea that it's what's best for the people of the country, I think that's a goal. I wanted to make one other point in this area, and that is um, for the, uh, I want to come back to and pick up on and accentuate uh, one thing that uh, Mauricio was talking about, the, the transparency of contracts. You know, um, it, it, uh, if there is a contract that's done by a sovereign entity or even a state-owned enterprise, uh, by and large, it should be, there should not be a non-disclosure uh, clause in that contract. And by and large, there should not be collateral uh, the problem with having collateralized contracts is it's very hard for governments, for the sitting government to know what it's worth. Uh, and, and so the partner that you're dealing with, they have a better idea of what that oil or whether the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the, the mine, the, uh, the metal that's being mined or whether the service that's being promised over a period of years they know better what it's worth than the government. So if it's a non-transparent contract with collateral, uh, it's it, it it's probably not what's in the best interest of the people of the country. It may be in the best interest of the government, the current government of the country. And so as, as we look forward, I think there should be a strong endeavor uh, not to use uh, non-disclosure clauses uh, and not to use uh, collateralized contracts for where the government is committing future assets to a contract. Um, that's that's a that's a general statement. And then to the specific statement, the regulatory framework is uh, is vital for allowing people to figure the right part of the spectrum for public-private partnerships because it's going to vary differently by sector. You know, if you're dealing with, let's say, a hotel sector, yeah, there can be public-private partnerships, but it sh probably should not be with the government owning the asset because uh, they're not going to be a very good maintainer of the asset. There needs to be another an, another part of the spectrum to look at. That's, I'm, 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 I'm not expert in this, but I think you have to figure it out in a rational way for for the best um, uh, the best way to attract investment and also let it be survivable through various administrations of a given country. Absolutely, sir. And, and right on cue on your idea that regulation should not change every other year or every four years. What would your recommendation be for governments in Colombia? in order for these opportunities to capture and, and exploit all the potential you just mentioned. And, and I don't mean the actual, the current governments, I'm speaking of government in general for the next decade. I'll, I'll just speak briefly and Mauricio may have uh, more insight and knowledge, sure. but as, as, as elections occur in countries, I think it's incumbent on candidates to say that they're going to play for the long run benefit for the people of the country. And that has big implications for the type of people they'll appoint to office and for the stability of the regulatory policy. And you, you know, one that I've written more about is the stability of the currency and the monetary policy of the country, the, the, uh, the, the, the desire and the going in position that you're not going to monetize fiscal deficits for a country, you're gonna borrow in, uh, in, fin in capital markets and deepen the capital markets in a way that doesn't cause inflation. 
Uh, so I think these are, you, you know, there, there can be basic uh, ideas that everyone agrees in, on, and then that allows plenty of room for political debate uh, ar around the, the ways that's done. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Claudio Caroni, uh, your, your, your uh, recommendations for future governments in Colombia would be yeah, but let me let me and I think David's giving a good one. But let me let me add to it, let me get more macro. Look, but it's not just about Colombia. If Colombia or any country in the region wants to attract more private sector, create conditions to really activate other sources of financing, such as institutional investors. And by the way, I've been now doing roadshows. I did roadshows in New York, LA, Miami, now Madrid, and, and talking to these institutional investors, then they have to accept a simple fact that trust, trust is critical to everything, and not just investment, but to economic growth and public health. We see currently that the main obstacles related to trust and, and our risk allocation, banking, environmental sustainability. And so this is really gonna be important. By the way, trust and certainty. And look, I'm, I'll make some news right now for you. You know, there's, you know, we, we, have, we, have, a, we have an important project in, in Medellin, Hidroituango, as you know. And one of the issues that we, we have there is that we need to have certainty. Every six months, we can't have a change in terms or bring uncertainty. That provides, that's uh, 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 dangerous to uh, uh, obviously financing uh, uh, in the long term. So long term, trust, confidence, certainty. We're actually working uh, on numerous projects across these fronts to really increase trust. And this is key in the region and really to empower investors to see, because they have to see that their money is being used for its intended purposes. By the way, as in a general terms on this trust issue, just one in 10 Latin Americans believe that other people are trustworthy. And I'm sorry to give you this big philosophical thing, but that's important because that's the lowest level in the entire world. It, the entire world. It's the most untrusting uh, region in the world. And we're actually going to have, and I'm saying this also because we're going to have a publication that we're going to put out now uh, uh, soon, which is going to deal with trust and its role in development. And we think that's groundbreaking, but that's key to the region, trust and certainty. Investors, companies, countries, we think it's also important that they need to know that they can trust trade agreements and compliance with them. That's going to be key as well. We want to see things. And I think, by the way, Colombia has made great progress in improving the regulatory, the institutional environment to increase private finance and infrastructure. Uh, however, look, it's true. Some challenges remain. And the IDB, obviously, though, uh, that's our job. Our job is to dive headfirst into these challenges and to work on these fronts in that regards. Ultimately, the financing of large projects is going to be an important historic opportunity to prevent this whole decade of lost opportunities for institutional investors who really manage, I mean, those institutional investors manage resource equivalent to 20%, 20% of Latin America's GDP. So, I mean, that's, that's how big this is. And yet, what do they currently invest in the region? Currently, only about 1% of the portfolios and in infrastructure in the region. That's a big issue. We need to change that allocation. Transparency concerns, and like I just heard it, I've heard it throughout my road shows. Transparency concerns about reputational risk, cancellation of contracts due to corruption uh, problems uh, that we've seen in some recent concessions. That's also created obstacles for disbursement of funds uh, that were intended, uh, frankly, to complete some ongoing projects and financing some new projects in that regards. And we hear that as well. And I mentioned beforehand. Uh, uh, in, in my last answer, you know, what, what I think is, is also uh, creating an unlevel playing field. So we think it's fundamental, it's fundamental to create mechanisms to monitor transparency, to improve the mechanisms of conflict resolution, key decision making, in order really not to affect the development of the projects. And I'm proud to say, you know, that we are uh, doing some really groundbreaking work on this front, particularly in Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you, sir. We're, we're running a uh, uh, tight on time uh, so this, this might be the last question well, a bit of forecasting uh yes sir please go ahead i i was i was going to uh, move to a wrap up but let me hear the final question and i'll give a brief well, answer, the I final question up. should be an uh, easy one uh what are the challenges that the private sector shall face in the next decade but please use your time to wrap up uh your uh your intervention here today Fabulous. Uh, Javier, it's been very good to be with you and with Mauricio. As we look to the future, the private sector, uh, I think, uh, it has, has savings uh, that are available to invest into Latin America and, and, and the Caribbean and is eager to do that. 
And so the challenge is to put this together in an effective way uh, that uh, promises both returns to the investors, but also a cleaner, greener environment, one that uh, produces more energy in a, in a less carbon dioxide intensive way, uh, and that is uh, a, that respects biodiversity and expands that, but also very importantly, creates huge amounts of new jobs in, uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Those are clearly needed. And it's going to take, you know, hundreds, actually thousands of projects done by private sector investors that are, uh, that are confident, that have confidence in the uh, regulatory policies, in the fiscal and monetary policies of the governments uh, that, they're, that they're dealing with. That's going to mean changes in Latin America and the Caribbean. Each country, I think, has to make improvements to be competitive in that environment. So that's that's my thought. The, that the opportunity is there, uh, and and this is the time for Latin America and the Caribbean to grab onto it and to use the tools that they have and the people that they have. This is a massive resource for the world, so it needs to be used used as 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 best as it can be. Thanks. Thanks for Thank having you. me on. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Claver Caron, your take on this? Yeah. So first of all, look, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge optimist and I really believe in the opportunities that we're seeing. And by the way, I believe that there's no region in the world that has more talented, skilled, more talented, uh, hardworking people than in Latin America and the Caribbean. And by the way, and I've, and I've been and, and, and I've been saying, stating this, 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 this fact uh, because because it's so it's it's really so so important to like put things in perspective. You know, here in the United States, if you took the Spanish speaking population and you made them a country, it would be the seventh largest country in the world, equivalent to the GDP of France, right? Like think about it, and that's the same people from the region, but just with different with a structure for generating businesses, uh, uh, incorporating into la labor force, women, uh, people of all types of of of, of ethnic backgrounds, gender, uh, 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 socioeconomic backgrounds, etc. So here's what we know. We know that the the, 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 the the most talented people in the world are Latin America and the Caribbean. And by the way, we're also seeing this is in the digital sphere. I'm a huge optimist there. This year, thus far already, and we're not at the end of the year yet, we've had $14 billion in venture capital investment going into Latin America and the Caribbean because we're seeing this digital infrastructure space, this digital uh, creativity space uh, throughout. 38 unicorns, those are businesses, those are, those are startups that have now generated uh, over a billion dollars in value, over a billion dollars in value, 38 new unicorns just this year alone. By the way, last year, which was a record year for venture capital investment in digital companies in the region, was just was just over four billion. We're already at 14 billion. You know, we're seeing these hugely innovative disruptors that are coming out throughout the region. Largest, re by the way, the largest companies in the war in the in the Latin America and the Caribbean today aren't the big infrastructure companies of the past, like the Odebrecht. It's Mercado Libre, right? The digital sphere. So imagine in the digital infrastructure sphere, we. If we if we can really 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 strengthen that in the digital infrastructure connectivity et cetera, imagine how we can even multiply that further and the effects that would happen in the fintech world. Thirty five percent of fintechs in the world right now, Latin America and the Caribbean, huge opportunity. Now let me land the plane in regards to infrastructure investments generally, though, in regards to uh, bricks and mortars, infrastructure investments, those related services. I, I don't think you can just play a central role. And, 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 and the reason why they can play that central role is because, and not just obviously because they're multiplier economic effect, but really by functioning as an instrument to, and here's the development side, to reduce social inequalities in the region. And that's gonna be key. Infrastructure has the potential to work as a mechanism, as a mechanism to, uh, for social economic uh, progress. You know, most of the workforce being represented primarily by blue collar jobs in the region, uh, builders, truck drivers, electricians, plumbers, those have been affected. Uh, by an economic shift towards the knowledge and more digital economy in the last decades. So here we need to figure out a way to increase that because of the huge opportunities, but also strengthen uh, that the, the blue corners and skill training, uh, et cetera, and the hybrid approaches. According to some figures from our labor market and social security information system, the construction sector in Latin America and the Caribbean is also along with the agriculture, the activity with the highest proportion almost half of all workers in the region with educational levels that are from zero to eight years of formal education with the lowest region. So in that regards, that's gonna be, it's a key sector in that regards, but also with skill training, we can take it to the next generation. About 10% uh, or less of construction workers in Latin America and the Caribbean have 
uh, uh, 14 or more years of schooling. So it's very uh, unusual in that regard. So it's key also in, in, in that sector. In Colombia, for example, uh, uh, we see that that situation is aligned with the regional average. By 89, 90% of the labor force there has less than 13 years of education. So we consider that the higher wage paid by those infrastructure jobs and the low educational barrier that characterize that sector, that can really provide a quick path towards a more equitable recovery of the region. So those are so there's no one that's left behind because here's the thing we saw with the pandemic. The pandemic created a digital breach, an infrastructure breach, but a digital infrastructure breach. So those that were connected and those that were not. So this is also gonna be key to make sure that people aren't left behind. We're seeing this rapid talent, this growth, which I started the answer with and the huge opportunity for the region, but you're gonna have a whole bunch of people are gonna be left behind. So that's why infrastructure has to be holistic in this regards. And we think that obviously to comply with the social mandate in that regards, we're gonna really need to reinforce, reinforce the way that investing in infrastructure and its services and operations are, are how that works to overcome uh, the, uh, the, 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 the focus on, on short-term job creation. And I think that we have here for the first time, and again, and, and I, I want to end by underscoring the historic opportunity we were in. This could be a Latin American Renaissance after the plague, right? This could be a huge opportunity. And we see, you know, how that's all created from, you know, the realignment of global value chains, from everybody recognizing the importance of digitalization, from this, the impact of small, medium-sized enterprises, from incorporating women in the labor force. And I told you that the, the huge impact that could have to GDP and the trillions of dollars in private capital that's being allocated for a renewable, looking for good renewable energy projects uh, in, in the region or climate friendly green projects in the region. These are huge opportunities. It's our job here at the Inter-American Development Bank to be the most innovative market oriented provider of solutions, to be the catalyst of that investment. Uh, I think we're on our way to it. Colombia has been a great partner. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, look, you know, uh, uh, each country is going to be masters of its destiny, but with trust, certainty, and the IDB as a partner, I think we're going to make that difference. Thank you, sir. Thank you to David uh, Malpasu. Gracias a la Cámara Colombiana de la Infraestructura. And, and thank you to all uh, uh, who have attended this conference, this conversation. And good luck to you, for uh, it will be the good luck of Colombia and its citizens. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>